Hi everybody, uh, welcome to a talk to, to my office and we will speak about today about the sea people, mere people, seals and the Faro warriors which is one of the main topics for today's presentation. Uh, it is a complex phenomenon of um, folklore uh, typical to Nordic and Baltic, but also in European and, um, and also Asian people. Uh, we will start with Genesis and Exodus, which is one of the most uh, important um, texts which speaks about freedom, slavery, homeland, uh, being together, uh, and about trust. Uh, the poem which you saw just now is written by Paul Eric Romo uh, at the very beginning of 1960s uh, under the Soviet Estonian government. Uh, so uh, our today's speech uh, is connected with uh, biblical topics in folklore. Florentina Patalonova Kellert points out that the vernacular versions of the Bible and other sacred texts are uh, not often in the middle of interest to scholars and are ignored also by the scholars of theology and religious studies who consider them marginal topic uh, which is paradox in itself since the biblical stories are examples of real lived faith. Uh, Patalonova points out that the interest is rather unidirectional from oral tradition to Bible to canonized text or <coughs> the scholars are uh, using uh, uh, to make research about uh, canonized text in everyday speech or also in folklore, but concentrating on the different genres and typology. At the same time, these stories are inexhaustible source for the study of religion itself. The term folk Bible is used by uh, Florentina Patalonova for many years. Uh, she is scholar just now in, in London, uh, but the term is also widely uh, used in, in French, uh, Slavic, uh, Canadian and other uh, scholars. Uh, the other terms are quite close, Bible of a Folk, used by Marion Pullman, or uh, Atli, who at the end of 40s proposed that there are uh, three different um, uh, topics in Bible uh, connected with uh, folklore and draw the attention that the third one, the tales which have derived from Bible and its silences, is uh, under investigated and, and very important uh, looking to the future. So, uh, our term for today is the Bible, uh, which presents <coughs> how biblical topics function in folklore and in folk culture in the context of narratives, rituals, customs, and also in iconography. Uh, the first part uh, of Exodus story uh, tells how uh, Israelitians escape from the Egyptian captivity under the leadership of Moses. In uh, folklore, the Moses was often replaced by, by Jesus Christ, or sometimes the Lord himself is uh, replaced by, by Mary or, or by, by Christ, and so on. So uh, the waters of the Red Sea divided before the Israeli peoples and closed over the heads of the warriors 
follow warriors. Uh, just now, when we follow the folk tales, we see that the pharaoh warriors uh, turned, uh, drawn, uh, warriors turned into the creatures with a human torso and a fish tail. They swim in search of a pharaoh and shout, pharaoh, pharaoh, pharaoh. And the next important topic uh, not only the etiology, but the next uh, important uh, remark is that the pharaohs or pharaoh and the warriors will become human only on the day of judgment. Some pictures <coughs> uh, which are <coughs> um, describing the, the escape from e e Egyptian. Uh, so Estonian narrators actually recall the stories of pharaohs were told during the evening Bible readings at the home. And um, if you look to, to the example <coughs> from Baida, it is quite in the middle of Estonia and uh, after the Second World War, uh, so the <coughs> correspondent describes how the father uh, read the Bible and retold the Bible story forward. They were chasing after the Israelites, were turned into fish, or half a man, half a fish, and we are supposed to, to mourn till this day, far, far. Uh, so, uh, Lourdes, who as a our main uh, uh, recorder of uh, folk uh, mythology and folk belief, who started his work as a student in Livonian coast, among Livonians, uh, was very fascinating when he uh, collected the first uh, pieces of far out people uh, sea cows, sea horses, and so on and so on. So he proposed to collect the folk Bible in Estonia and realized that it is quite difficult because um, often local correspondents they said that the story is too similar to the Bible and it is like a, a retelling or paraphrase uh, of a Bible and they don't want to uh, write about these stories uh, and to send them to the archives. Uh, so the uh, beginning is quite contradictory and quite awful and it needed much of trust to, uh, before the path was opened before the eyes of Israelites and so on. Uh, if we look uh, to the uh, folklore about the pharaoh warriors, we can see that they were widely known in European folklore, uh, almost in all areas, all states, uh, among all nations. Um, it's true that the main storylines, uh, the continuation of uh, Far warriors after uh, uh, being fishtailed, uh, it, it is different. And um, uh, during, uh, at the beginning of 20th century and just recently, at the beginning of 21st century, there uh, are uh, uh, plenty of uh, local investigations about uh, the story in folklore and, and also investi investigation, how the, the topic is reflected or folklore is reflected in the popular books start, and apocrypha starting from <coughs> very beginning of the um, uh, 13th century, <coughs> but in printed books in different areas, especially during the 18th and 19th century. Here you can see the four uh, uh, printed books, popular books, which was 
orientated to uh, readers and to to people who, who can buy the, the cheap booklets. And uh, actually, the text in all these <coughs> uh, booklets are the same. They are not they are word by word printed the same text, but there is changes in the titles. And they, in first uh, look, they, they look like uh, very different, uh, different stories. So typically, of course, the, uh, the, um, uh, people who um, happen to be the, the warriors, they are connected in, in uh, Slavic tradition with the Black Sea and so on and so on. Uh, but mainly, there is um, also um, important the original uh, place. I mean, it means Red Sea and so on. Uh, uh, how the, these uh, 19th century booklets describe the Faro people, it's also interesting. Um, you see the um, details which uh, later on um, are repeated in the folklore. Horses and weapon turned into fish and um, also what is made from this uh, so-called uh, pharaoh horses, fur and skin and so on. But also these descriptions were human heads but Interesting is that there is no body, one head, but nose and teeth and so on. So, uh, if we are looking uh, closer to, to Estonian uh, stories, we have more than 400 uh, recordings about the uh, Faro uh, warriors and Faro people. So we can see that actually the, the warriors um, turned to be, or um, they happen to be in different shape. They will be uh, sea spirits and sea horses. Uh, very rare texts about dog headed aquatic dwellers, uh, aquatic um, dog headed uh, dwellers are typically like um, described like um, uh, war robbers <clears throat> and um, here in these uh, versions they are attacking attacking the, the, and harming the ships and boats also fish and birds um, came out from the warriors whales sharks fish and mermaids mer people the, the most popular is the uh, stories about the seals who came uh, or formed from the far warriors. The same motive is also well known uh, in the folklore of Baltic and Northern peoples. Uh, but interesting is that uh, actually in the southern countries <coughs> there were dolphins and other creatures who came out from the, uh, from the war of warriors. A seal is a hybrid creature and can appear um, as a half human, half animal body. So the intersubjectivity of the tales is remarkable. People are telling and retelling the <clears throat> stories which they heard from somebody. It, it was the uh, discussion and dialogue basis, but also interesting are the transcultural and intermedia connections. Here is some examples. You can see how people saw um, the um, far out people on the pictures, in the books, they, they saw them, the Soviet pictures also in the street corners in Tallinn, uh, they saw the, the small sculptures hanging in the shops and so on. Uh, if we are thinking to the 19th century uh, and at the beginning of 
20th century. Uh, I think that you are also sure that all these pictures are uh, influenced not only by the pharaoh's tradition, but, but also with the mer people, mermaids and so on. Uh, so, uh, in Estonian tradition, we can see many different, uh, many different uh, versions, starting from pharaoh warriors, mermaids or seal mates, and of course the seals, which is really important in Estonian environment. So, uh, I think um, we must look also uh, to the area where the seals, northern area of the seals, uh, is uh, quite closely connected with Europe and northern America. But um, actually, the other type of seals, and I don't know, maybe they are also somehow connected in some work uh, with um, uh, Exodus. Let us see later. Uh, uh, other forms of seals are actually living also in in southern countries and in southern hemisphere. Uh, but I, as I see it, uh, every nation found the the most uh, remarkable animal to to connect with uh, far our people's tradition. Um, <clears throat> When we are speaking or speaking about the, the mare horses or sea horses and cattle, uh, the spreading area is actually western coast islands and a small part in, uh, in northern part of Est Estonia. But at the same time, uh, the biblical background uh, is the reason why all very well uh, known uh, topics and narratives are spread all over uh, Estonia. Not looking to the confession, because sometimes the confessional background is extremely important uh, in the spreading in the, the, the folklore pieces. But just now I, I asked uh, Laura uh, to help me and uh, to to demonstrate to you some of the basic uh, topics uh, within the seal uh, tradition. Uh, the basics are like a pharaoh who swims up to the ships or boats to ask people a question about the end of the world. The northern Estonian stories located all activities is done by the Emaiki River. My father told me that there are fish in the river in Mayagi that have such beautiful curly hair and a woman's face. It also has a woman's breast, but the bottom is like a fish bottom and ends with a fish tail. When you stand on the shore, it sometimes comes mass. Is to tomorrow judgment day? If you say, yes, it is, they are happy. They will immediately swim farther along the water. If you say no, they will be sad. They are actually human, and now they are cursed to be fish, and that when they will be free from the curse of the judgment day, they are called the pharaoh's fish. Uh, another one is pharaoh is released back into the water to take care of a child. A creature howls sadly. The fisherman search for a person who can understand her speech. A Jew or a gypsy can communicate with the creature. It comes out of the creature uh, has left an infant or small children in the sea who needs to be fed. In all the stories, the far person who was caught in the net is released back into the sea. The soldiers caught the far fish behind the Nysaras island. Uh, after all, the pharaoh's army had become fish in the Red Sea when they drowned. That uh, fish was a human in the front, a fish from the behind. It has wings and all, and it spoke the pharaoh language. But there was no such who could understand this pharaoh language. But there was a groan that spoke to it, that understood the pharaoh language. It cried just like a human, 
covered eyes with two hands and cried. That old that woman spoke to it, it uh, said to the crone that I left the little three-day-old child behind the grey stone behind the Nysar Island. Then it was released. It swim fast forward to the Nysar Island. So I'm very thankful to, to Laura because I, I have kind of respiratory virus <laughs> and he, he gives me she gives me the possibility to uh, uh, to to relax uh, a bit. So there are also a third very very important um, thing which is um, a story topic which is motive which is uh, actually connected with. Uh, demonstration at exhibitions. Uh, they are basically personal experience stories, uh, sometimes uh, uh, highlighted by eyewitnesses and uh, sometimes um, retold uh, kind of uh, kin stories or family stories, stories of previous narrators and so on. Uh, typical is that the Estonians were able to see the far of peoples in cities, uh, in Estonian bigger cities, but also in St. Petersburg, uh, which uh, was um, a capital city for imperial Russia at, at the uh, 19th century times and, and also later uh, in Riga, which was a very, very important economical uh, closest uh, big economical uh, city, uh, and in different um, uh, different uh, um, places also in Russia, because Estonian sol soldiers during the imperial Russian times, they as, as well as actually during the Soviet times, they served in imperial. Uh, uh, war forces. So also in zoos, in Tallinn and so on, in Firth, in museums, again museums, of course, in Petersburg, Greek, Tallinn and so on. But interesting is that the Estonians who uh, by boats and ships uh, several times visited Sweden, Helsinki, Finland and other countries, also Holland was a very popular destination they never speak about the uh, cities or, or zoos uh, in connection with Pharaoh people. So again, Pharaohs who are nursing a baby on a rock in the sea and a man who marries a Pharaoh, uh, which is uh, closely connected with the tradition of mere people, sea herder and so on, or somehow sometimes uh, coming to the port, to, to the fishing place, and asking fish. Again, sometimes with human voice. Uh, so the close, um, close area, close topics are connected with the sea cattle and sea horses. Part of them again um, uh, changed their shape um, uh, during the Pharaoh and Exodus accident, but they are also uh, living in the parallel world, in the water world. In Estonia we, we see the uh, sea cattle and sea horses, but also the freshwater animals. Uh, uh, quite typical are the meeting with the uh, sea cattle or sea, sea horses. And uh, they are interesting personal stories. Like also uh, the stories where the water cattle or the horse uh, comes into uh, a shore and mixes with the ordinary farm cattle. And sometimes they, some of them, go home, go to the farmhouse or with the farm's cattle. Uh, they, are, uh, they stay there for years but return to the sea or lake after seven years or after violating some norms, beating them or promising to kill them. Uh, also a fairy woman, 
uh, is connected with uh, sea cattle and she's coming from the sea world or mere world and uh, they are following the, the cattle also sometimes the, the horses um, and typically in the seashore there are two children one of them the girl or a small girl also old uh, old male herder but of course uh, the, the longer stories are connected with um, a female uh, who grows up and marries the farmer and so on there are many more like sometimes with uh, connections with Afara, uh, sometimes not, uh, which are speaking from the prehistorical times, uh, like part of coast animals and so on. Uh, the cattles, I wanted to draw attention that sometimes the connections are not, and the influences are not coming only from the books and so on, but also from reality. Because if we are look to the color of sea cattle and horses, we can see that they are blue or bluish and so on. And um, actually we know that animals were transported from the shores uh, of the Livonian Sea, uh, from Livonia to Sarama. Uh, uh, some uh, correspondents draw attention that typically the uh, uh, the cattle in Holland, in Netherlands, are uh, grey or white. Maybe the question is, at that time, maybe actually they, were, they came in ancient times from, from Netherlands. Okay, but uh, we know that actually in Latvia there lives a blue cow, a very, very rare protected uh, um, cow, and uh, I think it is a notable candidate for a, for the sea cow folklore, like a original example. Uh, so uh, just now it's a very endangered animal species. We know that um, this day, uh, year before, there was only 89 animals survived and which is also interesting is that uh, they produce large quantity of milk which was also the, the topic in, in folklore but also that they can survive very well without uh, helping uh, human hands without, uh, they, they can uh, stay healthy uh, in cold rain and wind. And um, <clears throat> so, um, um, one version how the artists um, painted and um, described the, the shepherd. I must say that at the beginning of 20th century, uh, the sea shepherd was typically the urban, nice urban person. Uh, so, uh, sometimes there was kind of um, dialogue um, where uh, a farmer uh, get legally they heard and so on. But uh, interesting is also um, the, the versions of story were actually a seaman caught one uh, herder in the net, uh, they put him to the boat. Again, we can see the, the parallel stories in many countries and uh, also the complaining that uh, or the sea, sea herder was called from the sea that come home, call, call, uh, call's herd is a uh, long at home and he replaced that he cannot come his leg is tied to the boat and so on uh, so uh, the leaving of sea uh, wife is quite unexpected and quite 
it, it happens quite uh, quite suddenly. I think for example here you can see that the woman describes his fishing with a man and and he describes why he lo why she loves because of the making beer and and what happens in the outdoor kitchen right now. Uh, so uh, she disappears. And, and another thing which is very typical to, to all uh, fairy, uh, female fairy wives um, is that um, she's asking about his, uh, where did you get me? About the origin and when the man describes replace, the woman will go away back to the sea. And uh, also typical to all these, almost all these stories is that um, uh, that the uh, fairy female comes back during the daytime and helps the children. But just now uh, uh, we must uh, draw attention also to the influence of uh, modern times to the different um, uh, different traditions and um, uh, it's very obvious in, in Africa, also in India and so on and so on. But we uh, made our choice and Laura, who is uh, who knows well uh, Japanese tradition, are uh, describing what, what happened in Japanese tradition. Well, uh, Japanese called the mermaid Ningyo. Uh, they have a long and complicated relationship with the water tellies and hybrid creatures and they're not uh, even sure uh, how, where it all came from. Uh, this illustration is how they were first described as. Uh, they belong to an ancient group of Japanese creatures called yokai, uh, which is a an, an never-ending uh, inspiring uh, investigations uh, where every time the mystery is solved the yokai uh, assumes different shapes and evolves uh, along with humans and uh, they just uh, keep inspiring us to ask questions. Uh, the same exact uh, definition applies to western people and uh, just as the westerners early Japanese people claim to have uh, physical interaction with the Ningyo. The earliest was dated uh, 619 CC, uh, present, near present-day Osaka, uh, when uh, fishermen ensured a creature shaped like a child. It was uh, neither a fish or a person, its name was unknown, and the previous uh, picture was this illustration of the Ningyo, and it uh, it is said uh, to be uh, dangerous and uh, more like a monstrous representation. Uh, it has a golden colored horns, a red belly, belly a body like a crab, it has uh, three eyes on the side of its torso. Along with the uh, uh, European contact that uh, to to aspire uh, different uh, versions to the Japanese imagination. The, uh, the Ningyo specimens that the Japanese uh, craftsmen sold to Europeans were intended to satisfy the Western expectation, just as the Western has uh, revealed. The Japanese also began to despise the the mer people as the upper body or beautiful woman with the uh, lower half of a fish. Although the following robes and covered with sections of this uh, Japanese mermaid that made her demise of her western uh, counterpart, uh, she never less uh, confirmed to the 19th centuries the western ideals of uh, mermaids. The Japanese simply adopted Western modifies into their well-known myths, imagine and work-wise. Work 
uh, the Mer people were the perfect vessels for such culture adoption on a hybrid civilization. Here is another. Uh, this is how it was later described by uh, the Mer people to be from the previous picture. Uh, so uh, coming just now back to Estonia because we have this uh, corpus of more than uh, uh, 400 um, recordings plus Estonian Russian recordings, half uh, approximately 50 and so on. We can say, see that actually the local features are preserving well and for a long time. Uh, and we can see the typical Western or so-called Anderson and so on mermaid only in uh, very late recordings uh, from younger people and um, actually Estonian mermaids and also sea uh, lake people and, and river people and river horses and river cattle they are never hybrids but, but they are more like a human being or they are uh, water version of animals. So uh, we, uh, we can trace that uh, Faro's uh, tradition was living folklore in the 1970s. It's quite late. It's after the, the golden period of folk narratives, belief narratives especially. And remarkable for, the, uh, for this folklore and also thinking about the Faro's uh, folklore, seals, and so on, was uh, Mark Sosa's documentary, uh, Faro Warriors, in 1974, which shows Kihno local farmers preparing for the seal hunt. Uh, the film is discussing about the sealing. The aim of the film was to help ban the industrial sealing. Uh, at that time, the seals were actually um, at the, at the, um, uh, in the situation that they will not exist anymore because of industrial sealing. Uh, so, uh, those are actually uh, also um, captured and, and demonstrated the traditional uh, sealing with fishing rod and also demonstrated how they, uh, how they humans uh, um, uh, harming the seal puppy uh, to put on a hook and when their mother came to rescue them and killed a uh, very brutal way. Uh, uh, these brutal brutalities was actually well known for centuries, but industrial um, killing and and uh, sealing was uh, quite awful. Uh, so the film uh, was very successful. So in Estonia, the sealing was banned. So no, no seal hunting anymore. Uh, but there is um, five countries in the world who are who have uh, seal hunting. It is a load and it's including, again, Russia. But if we are looking, so we can see that at contemporary times, the killing and trapping of seal pups is being banned in Russia and so on. At the same time, uh, the times going on and Kihno's cultural societies advocates that the seal, uh, seal hunting is um, very important um, uh, to save the traditional island culture. Uh, and we have uh, the third plan also, the third uh, pr proposition it is, but at the present time biologists uh, actually demonstrate and, and they speak that um, uh, the seal, several seal species are threatened by climate change, where birth giving is failing and the population is aging. So it's a somehow human 
before to, to stop sealing and uh, again to support the uh, seals uh, as much as we can. So uh, somehow it is a new look also to the old uh, pharaoh tradition but also to new look to the animal and human, animal and nature connections. So thank you very much for, for our side.